On Tech News Today, Nokia unveils what looks like a clone of the iPad Mini 3, but Nokia's is thinner, lighter, and costs half the price. Plus, New York City is rolling out the fast, free Wi-Fi that never sleeps, and Snapchat lets you send money. Let's just hope the cash doesn't self-destruct in 10 seconds. It's all coming up right now on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, November 18th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Prosper. Prosper is a peer-to-peer -peer lending marketplace that connects people who are looking to borrow money with those who have money to lend. Visit prosper.com slash twit and receive a $50 Visa prepaid card when you get a loan. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. I'm Mike Elgin, and good morning to you, Anthony Nielsen. Morning, Mike. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm feeling good. We have lots and lots of guests. It's another nightmare show for you. <laughs> no. My apologies. Looks I know good. you enjoy it. You love a challenge. I do. And uh, speaking of challenges, we also have Joe Panettieri, our Tuesday co-anchor. How are you doing, Joe? I'm doing really well, and I'm up to the challenge of that transition, Mike. Good to see you on a Tuesday. How you good been? Is, I'm doing great. Good to see you. Good to see R, your R2 unit there in the background. Yeah. That's uh, yeah, reassuring. Yeah, was missing that. You didn't see it last week, and I know there was some concern yeah. among our viewership. So uh, yeah. uh, I made sure that our stagehands here uh, moved around the unit. Personally, I was afraid you stripped him for parts, but apparently he is all intact and ready to do the news. So <laughs> why don't we jump into it? Nokia is back in the hardware business. The company unveiled today a new $249 tablet called the Nokia N1. The tablet runs Android Lollipop with Nokia Z Launcher user interface. And by the way, Z Launcher lets you select apps by drawing big letters on the screen with your finger. And in related news, Nokia put the public beta version of the Z Launcher on the Google Play Store so anyone with an Android device can now use it. Uh, Joe Panettieri, this news is interesting in multiple ways. The first and foremost, it looks exactly like an iPad. There, I guess Nokia is in the, in the clone business. Yeah, you know, I, th I think we're having or the vendors are having some trouble here trying to diversify or differentiate their products. Um, so, so as you point out, uh, this looks a lot like uh, the market leader. We're seeing something similar with HP today coming out with a uh, combination tablet and PC that looks a lot like Surface Pro 3. So I think as these designs get smaller and smaller, it's more and more difficult to stand out. And then part two of this is I think some people are, are, are confused in terms of, is this a Nokia product or a Microsoft product? And yes, Microsoft's done a pretty good job so far of, of rebranding most of the smartphone technology it has acquired from Nokia. But, but I think a lot of people forget that there's still this standalone Nokia company banging out tablets. It's even more confusing than that because Microsoft still sells the Nokia branded Lumia 2520 Windows RT tablet. So there are two right. Nokia branded tablets that are sold by two different companies. That's different. a new one. I don't recall that situation ever taking place. Now, the thing about the N1 is that in addition to looking just like the iPad Mini 3, it's actually slimmer, it's actually lighter, and it costs half the price of the iPad Mini 3. So it's kind of like, uh, for some users, it'll be the, 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 the better version of the iPad Mini 3. And one of the interesting things about it, like the iPad Mini 3 to a certain extent, is that it's a reversible uh, port. In this case, the USB-C connector, one of the first uh, that we've seen, and, of course, that's going to be a standard. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Apple pioneered its own proprietary standard where you don't have to worry about which way is up when you plug in uh, your tablet. Uh, just, just to quickly run through the specs, the tablet has a 7.9-inch screen, just like the iPad Mini 3. It has a uh, two, uh, uh, 248 by 1536 resolution display, pretty uh, run-of-the-mill specs overall, an 8-megapixel main camera, 5-megapixel main camera. And this interestingly, is going on sale. The first market for, for this device is China. China uh, is the, it's going to hit China in about early 2015 at some point and elsewhere later in unspecified countries and dates. And Foxconn is the manufacturer. So this, we talked about this yesterday, Joe. This was the big um, a mystery product that uh, Nokia teased yesterday. And they showed yeah. the box, and the box looked like an Apple TV, so everybody, was spec including us, were speculating <laughs> that this was a, a TV box. Right, right. Well, uh, no, it's not a TV box. You know, I, I think one of the other challenges you mentioned here, Mike, is, is this packaging, right? And when I go to a retailer, like a Best Buy, um, 
There are now so many similar tablet products on the market. I don't know where to start. There's there's the external packaging to start with, but then when you even when you go under the covers and you start going up and down the aisles, yeah, I think Nokia and others are going to have challenges going forward. Just trying to stand out from the crowd and all the re uh, on the retail shelves, especially when you got Black Friday coming and everyone's going to be doing discounts. So I'll be curious to see how soon they bring this into the U.S. market. And then uh, if and when they do, how Nokia is going to try and uh, differentiate from all of the other tablets on the market. It just seems like overkill at this point. Yeah, and Nokia does have advantages that they're apparently not uh, leveraging here. They have some of the best cameras in the industry, at least mm -hmm. for smartphones, they did. Imagine if they came out with a tablet that had a really, really amazing camera. That would be a differentiator. They have all kinds yep. of great technology that's not hardware-based. For example, they have their their uh, Here Maps solution is fantastic. They've got all kinds of really great technology. And if they could integrate all of that technology and have it be exclusive to Nokia products, those would be big differentiators. But what I see here so far, it doesn't seem all that differentiating. And like you say, it's just going to blend into the to the rest and they're going to struggle with this one probably. Yeah. And the other piece I would add is, is maybe with that camera technology, Mike, um, my mother-in-law, for instance, has an iPad. Um, she's got a separate camera. She can't make heads or tails of either of them. If she had a, a high-end tablet with a great camera, um, she'd be interested. So, uh, you know, I wonder if, if these uh, tablet makers will begin to micro-segment the market. Yeah, absolutely. Well, coming up, New York City's plans for all those absolute, obsolete, excuse me, phone booths. They've got them all over the city. What are they going to do with them? We actually talked a little bit about this in an earlier show. We'll tell you all about that. But first, I want to tell you about our sponsor today, which is Prosper. What could you accomplish with $35,000? You could remodel your kitchen. You could start a business, but here's an idea. Instead of going into more credit card debt this year for the holidays, why not give yourself a present and pay off the debt you've already got? With Prosper, you can get that loan in just five days. Prosper's online marketplace connects people who need money with those who want to invest. So check your low rate instantly without affecting your credit score. I want to repeat that. You can check your rate and it won't affect your credit score. Just go to prosper.com slash twit. Now for a limited time, Prosper is offering TWIT fans a $50 Visa prepaid card when you get a loan. So just go to prosper.com slash TWIT, and that's a special site just for you, the TWIT Army. Up to $35,000 in just five days and a $50 Visa prepaid card. Go to prosper.com slash TWIT. Joe, it looks like New York City is taking away Superman's dressing room. Yeah, taking away the dressing room, but giving us some Wi-Fi. It looks like New York City is going to replace all those uh, antiquated payphone areas with Wi-Fi hotspots throughout the city. Uh, now, do we have Ross Miller on the line with us to bring us some uh, insights as to what's going on here? I think we might have Ross Miller on the line. All right, Ross. How you been? It's good to be talking Doing to you today. Nice. Thanks for joining good us. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. It's uh, good now, to see first, you as well. First things first. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the payphones in New York uh, recently, but there is no room to change, even for yeah. Superman. Like, they've yeah, done don't... away with the closed space. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's good... a shame. Yeah, so goodbye enclosures. But on the other hand, we still have all these, uh, what would you call them, stumps almost, in terms of these uh, payphone spaces. What uh, is yeah, going on I... here? What, what, what's the city of New York going to do? Uh, so what the plan is, and this is just the, the first volley of the plan, they're kind of just announcing it now. It's an initiative called Link NYC, and it's a public-private thing. Um, City Bridge is the consortium, and what they're going to do is they're going to build what they're promising, 10,000 of these like pillars. And these pillars will provide uh, you know, domestic phone calls, touch screens, tell you where you need to go. But most importantly, free public 24-7 Wi-Fi um, that is reportedly secure and promises up to gigabit speeds. Uh, now, the, the rollout, they're saying, starts sometime by the end of next year, um, and it looks like it's going to take maybe as, you know, as far as 12 years to kind of get everything out to all five boroughs. Now, Ross, I'm a little confused about exactly how this works. Now, uh, first of all, the speeds, uh, are they're claiming 100 times faster than your average city Wi-Fi, which is not, it's not hard to be faster than your average city no, Wi-Fi, and 20 times faster than your average home internet service. Like you said, gigabit speeds, proof is in the pudding. We'll see it if they can deliver it. Uh, but this, these kiosks or these stumps, as Joe calls them, they, they, they have a keyboard that you can use. So you can surf the internet without even a phone, as I understand it, plus up to 250 devices can access each hotspot at once within a 150-foot range. Am I getting that right? It's It can be used directly by one person and indirectly by 250 people? 
Um, as for the 250 uh, number, I'm not entirely sure. I, my understanding of that kiosk, it's just for searching like New York destinations. We're starting to see some of that kind of stuff pop up in subways now too. Or like you don't know where you're going or you're looking for a store or something else that helps New York tourists get where they need to go. Um, that's probably what that's going to be for. Uh, for actually surfing the internet and checking, you know, watching Twit or checking The Verge, uh, you're probably starting to use your own device. Uh, but they're promising like a, an open Wi-Fi, you just log on, and once you log on once, it always remembers. Um, and they're promising it's going to be secure. Uh, they're still recommending be careful what you put, like what you browse on it. Uh, but a lot of it's still very, very, very early. I mean, this is just the announcement that City Bridge will be building these. Uh, I don't think the prototypes have even been made yet. Um, they have, you know, over a year, or about a year at this point, probably, to really meet the deadline of getting at least one installed, not to mm. mention 9,999. Um, and there is no end date for the deadline. It just needs to start by the end of next year. Okay. Now, what about the other broadband providers, like your cable companies, your telcos? How are they reacting to the fact that, that the city of New York is is pushing this type of project forward? Do they feel like this is competitive with their services, or, or did they bid for this project? Uh, honestly, I haven't actually looked for their reactions, but nothing's been super vocal. Um, if it's any, like, look, this is a promise, um, mm -hmm. but those speeds... No one is really believing it right now. So I think it, the proof will be, like I said, the proof will be in the pudding. Um, if it's anything like public Wi-Fi, it's never been a big deal. I don't think anyone's going to be able to use this to replace their home internet. Uh, so Time Warner Cable, which may future be Comcast, uh, I think they're okay for now. Um, but this is, this is interesting. This is a very ambitious project. We've seen public Wi-Fi happen in other cities, and the result has not it's been rather, like, rather hit or miss. And... If they pull us off in one of the biggest metropolitans in the world, uh, that will set standard and precedent. But I think right now everyone's kind of holding their breath and saying, well, are these promises really going to happen? Up to gigabit speeds could be dial up, you know, and like as long as it's less than gigabit, they kept their promise. Now, the City Bridge contract is a $200 million project, uh, contract, but this is going to pay for itself, isn't it? That's the goal. I mean, this is the way they're kind of selling it to people. It's just like, look, it won't cost taxpayers anything. They're going to get all their money back through advertising. Uh, and in addition to that, they're going to get the city $500 million over the next 12 years. And that's not going to be like $42 million every year. I'm sure it's going to ramp up as they expand into these. Because if you notice, like, there's two kinds of kiosks. There is the what they're calling the residential one that's just a thinner pull. And then the commercial one. Uh, which will have like these signs and these video ads, I'm sure. And that's where the money is going to come from. And part of the consortium is this company called Titan. And they're really good at outdoor advertising. I'm sure that's going to be where they get most of the revenue from. And uh, one of the things I'm fascinated with uh, in this story is the fact that because of the range of this Wi-Fi, there are going to be apartments that were, are going to be able to access this Wi-Fi from inside the apartment. And for those people, it's a big score because they just get free Wi-Fi all the time. I mean, hopefully. So I we'll, mean, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, we'll I, see. I, I, I'm, I'm holding my breath. Like, especially people living on the 12th floor, yep. being able to grab this, be one of 100 people maybe on that specific you know, connection, the speeds will be lower, congestion, security concerns. And there's so many questions here. Uh, I think hopefully in the next six months, we'll start seeing an idea of what's happening. Uh, but right now, it's like a brilliant, you know, utopic idea that would, you know, if they pulled off, that's amazing. If they don't, it's kind of par for the course. Ross Miller is at TheVerge.com, and you can follow, her, follow him on Twitter at O-H-N-O Roscoe. What, is that, what does that mean? Oh, I, just Roscoe. I just liked how it looked and I didn't like any other vowels. All right. Well, that's where you can find, that's where you can <laughs> find Ross. Thanks for joining us, Ross. Thank you. Take care. All right. Snapchat launched yesterday a feature for sending money. It's called Snapcash and it's enabled by the payment service Square. To use it, you enter details of a debit card and after that you start a regular chat and then just enter a dollar amount, which surfaces a special green button. When you tap on the green button, the money is transferred. Kurt Waggage is a reporter for Recode and joins us now. Hey, Kurt. Hey, good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Now, is this essentially Square Cash conveyed via Snapchat? Essentially. So Square uh, already offers a similar service. As you mentioned, it's called Square Cash, and that enables people to send money to one another via uh, either a mobile app or you could send money directly to someone's email. So what Snapchat did is they essentially took that technology, partnered with Square, and put that same technology in their app. So now you can you can send people instead of uh, you know using an email or the Snap uh, excuse me or the Square Cash app, you just use the Snapchat app to do that. 
Now, what does the recipient need to do in order to receive money? Do they also have to have something set up? Uh, presumably, they have to have their, their debit card set up, right? Yeah, so the money goes directly into the recipient's bank account. But of course, in order to do that, uh, Snapchat, or in this case, Square, is the one who actually holds all the financial information for users. Square needs to know what bank account, uh, the bank account number, the routing number, all that kinds of stuff. So in order to receive money, you also have to have, uh, I guess, what would be a Square uh, cash account. And so when you sign up for Snapcash, uh, you'll be creating a Square Cash account and and giving them your banking information in order to accept the money as well. Now, uh, Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel told you that Snapcash doesn't compete with Venmo or PayPal, but that's not true, is it? They this is a direct competitor. It is, and they don't feel that they're competing in that way. That's according to Evan, and and from our conversation, he says, "Hey, this this isn't us trying to make a huge play in the payment space. This is more trying to." introduce a feature that we think our users will find fun and, and entertaining. But really, when it comes down to it, as the feature evolves, as they expand to more users right now, it's just uh, people who are 18 and over, it makes logical sense that it will compete with Venmo or will compete with PayPal because those are other services where people are sending money from one another, where, where money is exchanging hands between friends. So whether or not they see it that way, I mean, I, I think it's probably it would have been silly for him to come out yesterday and say, hey, we're going out. After Venmo, we're going after PayPal, these established brands. So obviously he played the conservative route by saying, oh, no, this is just a fun feature. But I think when it comes down to it, it offers the same uh, utility that the, those uh, other services do. So they will be competitors. And of course, uh, Snapchat is available for Android now and later for iOS users. Is there a fee charged to users? And, and presumably Square gets a fee as well, don't they? So there's no fee for users, which kind of leaves... Uh, it up to question, you know, who who's really paying for this? Because obviously, uh, typically when there's a, a transaction like this, the service provider, in this case it would be Square, um, would take a, a small cut. But because uh, users are able to send money without having to pay a fee, it, it leads me to believe that Snapchat is probably paying that fee uh, for each user. Although, you know, from conversations I've seen on Twitter, from people who have reached out to me since the story has uh, ran, some people have said, hey, maybe this is actually uh, Square paying that fee just because they want to accumulate the users on Square Cash and get that credit and debit card information in their system. So either way, one of these two companies uh, is probably losing a little bit of money with each transaction. But, you know, they view this as a long-term play, uh, either Square by collecting all the information from our payments information or Snapchat by, you know, building this new tool for users that will hopefully keep them using the app. Now, do you get the sense that uh, this is going to be uh, an ongoing exclusive relationship with Square? Or do you think they'll end up supporting uh, Google Wallet or Apple Pay or, you know, even uh, uh, support credit cards? It's a good question. And, and my hunch is that they're going to stick with Square, certainly for the time being. In my conversation with Evan, he talked a lot about how much he respects Jack Dorsey, which is Square's uh, co-founder and CEO. He, you know, they have a tight relationship. That's kind of how this whole partnership came together. And I think that in this case, he he wants to stick with one one person who he thinks uh, can do this well, and that is Jack and Square. That being said, I do think it, it could expand beyond just debit cards, which is what it is right now, and make logical sense to add credit cards uh, in the future, or possibly even, um, I guess debit cards do this, but essentially just bank uh, account to account transfers where you don't even have to have debit card information, you just have to have your account information. But um, all of that is, you know, to be determined. Uh, I'm not sure it depends on how much they view payments as the future or, or a revenue stream for Snapchat. I think right now they're trying to roll it out and just kind of see how people are using it. And then they'll look to expand as they get that information and see what types of use cases are, are you know, popular with Snapchat users. Kurt Wagner's at Recode.net. You can follow him on Twitter at Kurt Wagner 8. Thanks for joining us, Kurt. Absolutely. Uh, thanks again for having me. All right. Well, Joe, it looks like Intel is getting into the fashion accessory business. Yes, tis the season for wearables. And we're looking at the Mica fashion, fashion bracelet uh, this week, which is launching, as you mentioned, by Intel. Now, here with details on what exactly Intel is up to in this market is Ed Bake, the tech columnist over at USA Today. Ed, how you been? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Hey, can you tell us a little bit of detail here? What is the Mica fashion bracelet? Well, let me quickly correct you. It's Mika. I thought it was Mika too, but they told me it's Mika. <laughs> um, what is it? It's it's obviously a wearable, which we've seen a gazillion of them already out and a gazillion more coming. 
But they're paying attention, Intel and their partners, opening ceremony, which is a fashion house. They're paying attention to style, to fashion. This is aimed at women. It's not inexpensive at $495. These are high-tech fashion bracelets made of, you know, and it, there's two styles, one with white uh, snake skin, one with black snake skin. Uh, but the tech part comes with notifications, with uh, the ability to check on your Gmail, Facebook posts, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's marrying fashion with tech. And, you know, these things are called wearables for a reason. We wear them. And how many of the things that have been out there so far have been rather geeky looking? Well, here's an attempt to make something that looks good also you know, double with the tech stuff. Now, one of the freaky things about this bracelet is that it comes with a two-year AT&T contract for data, right. and it doesn't pair with a phone. So you get notifications of the kind you get through your phone, but it, in fact, doesn't pair with a phone, does it? It does not. And I, uh, I thought that was rather curious. I mean, on the one hand, some of us, myself included, have, have kind of criticized some of the uh, early players in wearables for relying too much on the phone in your pocket, you know, that it's just an extension of the phone in your pocket, on the other hand, while you don't want to necessarily rely on it, it is useful to know if somebody is calling you uh, or even getting tweets, which you can't get on this thing right now. So there are limitations, certainly, in, in this first version. So, Ed, is there an SDK for this? Is this something that's going to be expand, uh, expandable and extendable by software developers, or is it yeah, a closed they, system? I believe they are going to open it up to developers. Right now, there are no separate apps for it beyond the, the initial uh, partners. You know, they have partners like TomTom Tom and, and Yelp. So if you're near, there is GPS in here. So if you're near some restaurant, you might get a notification, hey, you may want to check this place out. Uh, but uh, it, it seems that would obviously be the future here, that you would want to open it up and open up the app possibilities. Intel is taking a rather, I guess, conservative approach here on the tech side. Uh, I wonder if that has to do with the people that this may be aimed at. It's, it's being sold more as a fashion accessory rather than a high-tech thing. In Barney's, for example, where it will be sold, it will be in the jewelry case. Um, so they're sort of weighing that, you know, tech versus fashion and back and forth. Uh, it's, it's a fine line, I think. It's also going to be available online at openingceremony.us. Now, Mika stands for My Intelligent Communication Accessory, and it also has an interesting feature that, uh, that ties into TomTom, Tom, uh, and the feature is called Time to Go. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, basically, it's just going to let you know it knows your next appointment, and it's going to nudge you, hey, you better, you better get going. You know, you're going to be late, that kind of thing. Uh, and we've seen that, you know, we see things like that with Google and what they've done uh, with wearables and with phones. Um, it's a nice feature. Uh, again, I haven't tested this thing. You know, I saw it at an event, but I haven't actually tried this, and it's not aimed at me anyway. They don't have a version for men just yet. And Intel claims two hours, uh, excuse me, two days of battery life. Up to two life. days. Yeah. yeah, up to two days. And of course, battery life has been a humongous issue with all the wearables that, yeah. that have come out so far. That's a huge issue. And one of the questions uh, certainly surrounding the Apple Watch when that comes out next year. Ed Begg is at usatoday.com and you can follow him on Twitter at Ed Begg. Thanks for joining us, Ed. Anytime. Search engine results qualify as constitutionally protected free speech in the United States, according to a California judge. San Francisco Superior Court Judge Ernest Goldsmith yesterday struck down a website owner's claim that Google violated antitrust laws by featuring ads instead of the plaintiff's site, saying that search, in, search results and ad placements are speech and therefore protected by the First Amendment. Greg Sterling wrote about the news for Search Engine Land and joins us now. Welcome to you, Greg. Hi, how's it going? It's going great, thanks. This appears to be consistent with other U.S. court cases and wildly inconsistent with how European law ver views search results. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So the first time that um, the first time that we saw a court say that search results were protected First Amendment speech was in 2003, and that was a case called Search King, I believe, in Oklahoma. We haven't seen any appeals court decisions, which would, of course, be higher authority, but most of these cases have existed at the district court level, the entry-level court at the in the federal system. The case yesterday was a uh, state court, California state court opinion. Um, so there's a pretty, pretty good uh, set of decisions that say search results are editorial decisions 
that are protected by the First Amendment. In Europe, it's a very different situation. They have speech protections and place a value on free speech, but they don't have a, a body of First Amendment law similar to the U.S. So what what we see over there is a very different climate where Google has a 90 plus percent market share versus 67 or so in the US. And they are very much of the opinion that Google is a monopoly and needs to be restrained. Uh, and they've been working on that for the better part of the last couple of years, trying to reach a settlement with Google, which has thus far not been forthcoming. So how many types of different restraints might we see going forward? Is, is this just one instance of many restraints that could be coming? Or do, do you see this as an isolated case and we should just focus on this for, by na uh, right now? Are you referring to the California decision or are you talking about the European market? The European market. Well, so what, without going into a very complicated situation in depth, what's happened is that Google reached a settlement with the uh, European Commission to favorably display competitors' results at the top of their search results. The complaint has been that Google is manipulating search results for its own benefit, favoring its own results over competitors, and this is an antitrust violation. That's the argument. Microsoft and Yelp and others are behind that position. Um, so we, we, there are many factions in Europe that are interested in restraining Android and in, in, in Google search and very concerned about privacy, uh, Google's unified privacy policy that uh, collects data from its different properties, including YouTube. So we're, we're probably looking ultimately at multiple uh, points of restraint uh, for Google, but that it's not what the specifics are haven't yet emerged. Now, you pointed out that Europe's... Uh sort of disagreement with this whole concept that it's speech and therefore there's an absoluteness to constitutional amendments like this in the United States that doesn't really exist in European law. Uh, and you said that this is tied to Google's extreme monopoly position in Europe, a situation that doesn't quite exist in the United States, 90% versus whatever their, their lower market share is in the United States. But this uh, right to be forgotten stuff applies to Bing as well. It applies to little search engines too. So even separate from the antitrust question, they do treat search engine results as something that can be meddled with extensively. And it's not just right to be forgotten, it's also this whole th uh, series of cases that have popped up locally throughout Europe of you know requiring uh, companies to maybe pay for search results or, or forcing uh, Google to limit what it shows in the search results for news sites. We saw that uh, case recently. There's just a fundamental fundamentally different view apparently in the courts in Europe and in legislatures in Europe uh, between what search results are and what that represents, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's the, you alluded to the whole, uh, all the news publishers that are trying to effectively get licensing fees from Google and their attempts through copyright law in multiple jurisdictions to control that unsuccessfully thus far. Um, yeah, I, I, again, there's a, there's a free speech tradition in Europe or a, a value placed on speech and protection of speech, but we don't have the same uh, sort of extreme or strong First, First Amendment style body of law. And the right to be forgotten is a particularly problematic area for reasons that we can't go into in this sort of short segment. It's, it's just been a mess from an enforcement standpoint, and it does uh, impact the public's right to know about certain kinds of things. The Europeans in general, I think, see Google as a, as a symbol of uh, the overreach of American technology. The, the, they're, they're resistant to it in part because it is not a homegrown entity. Uh, they have not been able to produce one thus far. And the NSA spying and surveillance scandals uh, don't help matters for Google. So there's there's many different things working here, conspiring or uh, kind of against Google uh, f from a sort of European political standpoint and legal standpoint. Now, one last thing, uh, Greg, for people who, who are unfamiliar with California law, there's a weird California thing going on here that may be confusing some, uh, some people. Google filed what is called an anti-slap motion. What the heck is an anti-slap motion? Well, so SLAP stands for Strategic Lawsuits Against Public Park participation, I believe, if I got that correctly. And they are um, usually attempts by large corporate entities or powerful interests to intimidate individuals or nonprofits or critics of some sort of policy. You usually see a kind of David and Goliath situation where the entity suing to prevent some sort of criticism of a, of a, of a private interest or corporation. And so the anti-slap law is, is designed to prevent 
the suppression of this kind of criticism or, or speech or public debate. And the irony in this particular case is that there, you had an individual, this guy Martin, uh, Martin is the last name, who ran a very small website and he sued Google because he was frustrated by his inability to rank on Google uh, versus Bing and Yahoo. And Google comes back and uses this anti-slap, anti this sort of pro-First Amendment, pro-speech uh, law to kind of quash his lawsuit. So you have a reversal of the usual David and Goliath situation where Goliath in this case is using the David tactic to, to smash the, uh, the, the true David in this instance, which is this guy, um, uh, Lewis Martin. And of course, Google has always maintained this First Amendment uh, uh, right uh, for free speech for search results. Now, we, the chat room is, is exploding in curiosity about the birds that we hear. Can you tell us about those? <laughs> oh, yes, I'm a, an eccentric billionaire and I have thousands That's of birds in my house. No, actually, it's just my one, uh, it's my one uh, parakeet. It's my, da my daughter's, my daughter's parakeet, actually. Sorry. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for filling us in. That That is a prolific parakeet. Greg Sterling is at searchengineland.com and elsewhere. You can follow him on Twitter at G Sterling, and you can find his parakeet every time it appears on this show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right, talk to you later, All right. Mike. Well, we got some email from TNT fan Andrew Bello, who sent us an email about our coverage of the Target map app we talked about yesterday. He wrote, Quote, you mentioned how Target may miss out on all those people that buy things unexpectedly if they're focused on the app rather than on looking around the store for products to buy. But this app could actually help Target with their store layout. They can choose where to put different things, and the app could gather data to show them where to place items to maximize sales. And that's a great point, of course. That couldn't really exist until they add beacons, which they almost certainly will add, uh, as we discussed yesterday. They're, they're going to add beacons. There's no question about it. And at that point, you'll have turn-by-turn -turn directions and exactly the kind of big data uh, intelligence that you're talking about where they can optimize and try different things and use algorithms where to place things to get you to buy those all those products at Target. Well, a few updates for you. China is blocking websites and apps that work with Verizon's Edgecast. The company confirmed the block and posted on his blog that they have no idea why Edgecast is being blocked. The anti-censorship site Great Fire, however, says the Chinese government didn't want Chinese citizens to use Edgecast to access banned websites. You see, Great Fire hosts cloud-based versions of sites banned in China using cloud providers like Edgecast, so Chinese users can access those sites through the so-called Great Firewall of China. The only way for the Chinese government to stop this is to block everything from those cloud providers that host such sites, and that's what's happening here. Everything from Edgecast is being blocked just to shut down those few sites that are using the cloud uh, duplications of the banned websites. Now, the Great Fire service in question is called Collateral Freedom, and it's used by independent Chinese news sites like Boxun, among others. Collateral Freedom uses multiple cloud providers, including Amazon's AWS, so we can expect, expect more cloud service sites to be blocked any minute now. <laughs> in other news, researchers at Google and Stanford have independently created software that can recognize not only objects in a photograph, but entire scenes. Yeah, the, the computers can figure out what's actually going on in the pictures. The technologies were revealed in separate published papers. Both groups use neural networks. The technologies could be used for indexing photographs on search engines, helping self-driving cars to understand what's going on in traffic, or enable killer robots from the future to find Sarah Connor. Joe, that's amazing technology, don't you think? Essentially, uh, how I how I understand it is they, you know, right now we know that uh, Google and other uh, uh, companies and organizations can figure out what's happening in a picture. They can say, okay, that's a person. Right. And in Google's case, they can even say, well, that's a child, that's an adult, that's a dog, that's a cat. They've demonstrated this on Google Plus and elsewhere. What this is doing is it's looking at everything in the scene. It's saying, well, there's a dog, there's a cat, there's a parakeet, there's a sky, there's the grass, there's a car, there's this, that, and the other thing. And therefore... What's happening in these pictures, the car's driving down, people, you know, whatever. It can figure right. out what's going on in the picture. And that is pretty mind-blowing technology. It's all about data context, right? And, and think about the big data implications here, where suddenly you've got, uh, you know, a picture in one system in California and a picture in another system in Europe and a picture in another system in China. As these big data systems come together, they're going to be able to triangulate all those images and maybe, uh, you know, we always talk about missing footage from various incidents. Well, these big data systems will collate and bring together all that information, provide the context about what happened at a specific event, et cetera.
Yeah, it's pretty amazing technology. And hopefully uh, this will be available to the public and not just the Pentagon. I'd like to be able to play with some <laughs> of the stuff myself. Uh, it sounds very, very cool. A law firm in Canada is using data from the fitness tracker Fitbit to demonstrate personal, personal injury to its client. Their client was injured in a car accident four years ago. The law firm plans to use Fitbit data to show how low her activity dropped after the accident, thus proving injury. So let this be a lesson to all of you. If you get injured in an accident and you want to prove injury, make sure you're wearing a Fitbit and don't do anything after the accident. And you can say, see, I couldn't do anything. <laughs> Pretty interesting. I, I, I can't believe, Joe, that this would be admissible in court. This is just so obviously yeah. easily uh, gamed. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> the lazy get even lazier after an injury. So yeah, um, I'd be a little, I'd be a little skeptical of the data to say the least. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, our TNT fan of the day is Greg Del Pino in Charlotte, North Carolina. And there he is in Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been in Charlotte, North Carolina. I remember huge skyscrapers like that. Anyway, there he is uh, looking cool and listening to tech news today. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google+, Twitter, or Facebook and use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. That is the tech news today. And Joe Panettiere, thank you so much for everything. I always ask if you've got anything to plug and I'll ask you again. You got anything to plug? I do have something to plug, actually, right. um, and it's actually pretty interesting. We've got an interview with the CEO of Boundary uh, coming up on our website tonight at 9.01 Eastern in a podcast format. And uh, that interview is with Gary Reed. He has previously built and sold a $350 million software company. He's going to tell our listeners how he did it. And he's also going to tell quite a bit about how his company is monitoring and managing Amazon Web Services. So for any of our viewers and listeners who are really interested in moving workloads out to Amazon and how to make the most of them, Gary Reed's your guy. And that's going to be a uh, podcast at 9.01 p.m. Eastern on Afternines.com. Wonderful. Joe Panettiere, content czar at Afternines. Thanks for joining us as our co-anchor this Tuesday and every Tuesday. Thanks, Mike. Take care. All right. Well, you can subscribe and you should subscribe to the audio or video version of Tech News Today on iTunes, or you can choose some other way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. Follow us on Twitter. Tech News Today TV is our Twitter name. Join our Google Plus community. Just search Google Plus for Tech News Today and you'll find all our stuff. Send us email to twit, TNT at twit.tv or leave voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW. And don't miss our evening newscast, Tech News Tonight at 4 p.m. Pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the Twit Network. My name's Mike Elgin. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow.